Okay, so Dune Part 2 has got a big scene in it that's been living rent free in my head ever since I saw it. We have Paul showing up in the south with a sandworm behind him and that big hands him a score rocking in the back. Timothy Chalamet then goes on to give an Oscar winning performance and yeah, I think it's incredible from start to finish. Why? Well mate, that's something I want to discuss in this video as I think there's a lot to unpack. Whether it's the cinematography, the acting and the hidden meaning, everything adds to this being an incredible moment. So come with me my Fremen as we deep dive into Dune and uncover the hidden layers going on beneath the surface. There's going to be some heavy spoilers here as well so if you haven't had a chance to check it out then you better check out now. Please hit the thumbs up and make sure you subscribe as we're going to be doing breakdowns like this every single week. Without the way, thank you for clicking this. Now let us get into Paul's arrival. I do see a way. There is a narrow way through. Now this takes place after Paul's consumed the water of life which has now enhanced his prescient abilities. This has unlocked sections of his mind and given him the genetic memory that exists within his bloodline. Upon consuming it, one fully opens up and sees all their history and the knowledge that comes with it. Now we'll be talking later on about a character that this could influence but I think it's an important part to bear in mind in this video. Typically these rituals are only done by women though because they're the ones selected to become the Bene Gesserit. Paul's going to be the first man to live through it though and this unlocks things that weren't given to the others. Now he's able to view several possible futures and use them as a way to navigate the correct path. In the book, it's a complete overloading of the senses in which he sees almost everything at once. He doesn't even know if the future is the past and it's something that completely changes him as a person. Now how they describe it is basically, if you could imagine you kept getting visions of the future. Eventually you'd have them for so long, you'd not be able to remember when it was you first got them. You'd then have spent so much time with them that thinking about them would be you remembering them so you might even start to confuse them with the past. The work has this happened when Chani seems to have gone to the south with Paul wondering if it's actually happened already or if it's just about to. Because of this he's completely detached mentally and not the man that he once was. Paul is now almost like a harbinger of death which we see right from this opening shot. Huge shoutouts to Bobby Lovell on Twitter for pointing out that there's something to do here with this score that subtly hints what's going on. The Atreides theme in the first film especially was something that was dominated purely by bagpipes. Here though, that's all stripped away with it resembling more of that Harkonnen theme. Bobby picked out that if you go to the soundtrack and compare this with the Harkonnen arena that they line up in more ways than one. This shows that he's braced the Harkin inside, the lineage of which he learned just the scene before. The scene in itself almost is shot like it's black and white and this symbolises the path that he's now walking. Pacing slowly through the desert we see a sandworm almost erupt behind him and come crashing out the dunes. Now, this idea of walking is something that's laced throughout both films and it's often present when Paul has a vision. He says in one that he sees a figure walking through the desert and surrounded by them is death and destruction. This is him following his mother to the death of billions which he's done by spreading his name and prophecy. Now though Paul's walking towards us and he's bringing that death with him to us. Hooded figures are often used to symbolise death and I definitely feel like his arrival is synonymous with that. His holy war will change the face of Arrakis which is exemplified in the very next moment. Approaching the Fremen we see them moving out of the way for him and get a bird's eye shot of him walking through the crowd. Now this is symbolic on a number of levels because this resembles grains of sand. Arrakis is of course made up of it and it's something that the planet is completely covered in. Of oh, Captain obvious there, oh, but Paul wants to change the landscape and usher in a paradise. After drinking the water of life he gets a vision of his future and catches a vast ocean covering the planet. This will completely transform it and change what Arrakis is but this is also going to come with a cost. The sandworms will drown and the Fremen will change which is something Jew Messiah also touches upon too. Now, I'm not going to get into major spoilers from that but there is a part of it early on that always stood out to me. A certain character we follow says they long for the desert and though things haven't changed into the paradise Paul envisions they are starting to alter. Paul moving through this crowd like it's a grain of sand is too symbolic of how he's going to change the Fremen. He will alter not only Arrakis but also them too which this shot of him walking against them sums up for me. So we not only have Paul walking through without being stopped but we also have the three key things he's going to change. The worm is behind him, the sand's being shifted and the Fremen themselves are being moved out of the way. 
This is steeped in lots of religious imagery too, with it being reminiscent of Jesus' arrival during Palm Sunday. Now inside we get, we get bloody Timothy Chalamet hitting a home run and delivering a performance I didn't think he had in him. Gonna be honest, when they announced he was doing Paul, I thought that the guy was gonna drop the ball. But I'm not a rapper. Sure, I could see him nailing the stuff from that first film and being the young scrawny kid who was clearly at his death. However, Paul's arc requires him to become a leader and it's just something that I couldn't see happening. This was coupled by Javier Bardem, who's been an imposing figure in my mind ever since No Country for Old Men. No matter what he's in, he always steals the show and thus I couldn't imagine Chalamet matching up to him. I was completely wrong though mate, LLL, and both these actors perfectly aid each other in this moment. Bottom's someone that we've grown to love throughout the film and he's easily my favourite character in the movie. Sure the memes, they're going wild right now but that's done to show how memorable he is as a character. We're supposed to side with him and see him as likeable so that when he likes Paul we also like him too. Here I really see the change in him though and we catch him with his head down accepting of his death. Stelgar was fully expecting Paul to arrive and kill him and then take his place on the Fremen War Council. Just a couple of scenes before this, Paul said he didn't believe but Stelgar rebuffed this by saying that he did. So here he's fully willing to give up his life and allow Paul to beat him so he can lead the Fremen's future. He truly wants what's best for his people and will die knowing that Paul has overtaken him. Now Jenny knows this is going to happen too and she tries to reason with him before he goes too far. She's well aware of how her people have been indoctrinated and knows that this prophecy is there to enslave them. The first movie opened with Chani talking about the war with the Harkonnens and then wondering who their next oppressors would be. Though Paul's leading them to victories, Chani's also well aware that it's something that could lead to more deaths. Chani's a dissenting voice in the crowd but she's ushered to leave which is when she has an outburst. This prophecy is how they enslave us! At this point she's grabbed by Gurney and she tells him it's none of his business. He says that the Harkonnens gave him his scar though and we see how quickly that her ideas are shut down. This highlights what's really going on here too and that charlatans exist in the room amongst all the crowd. Gurney's there like one of the Fremen even though he doesn't believe in the prophecy. He's someone who wants to get Paul to use it to his advantage so that he can use the Fremen as a way to get revenge. If Chani brings this to their attention, it's going to potentially stop that and mean that the Atreides can't get their revenge. So she wants to stop this train before it starts, but unfortunately Chani, the ride's it's, it's already out the station. That's because Jessica has been moving through the south purely with the idea of setting up Paul's ascension. She too is fully aware that the prophecy can be used and it's the only way to protect her and her children. She's of course joined by Alia as well, who at this point is manipulating things from the shadows. Now I know in the book that the prophecy is something that people think may come true and I definitely think that it can be argued. The way the movie takes things so, I think that it's fake and that Paul's using his abilities to make sure it comes true. The prescience and the ability to see the future, that's all true, but he's weaponizing it and leading things to the outcome that works out the best for him. He's well aware that going to the south will lead to billions of deaths but it's also the only path that's going to keep him alive. It'll also keep his family and friends alive too, which is something we see with how he tackles Stilgar. He should really be an impossible situation where he has to choose between defeating the Harkonnens or saving his friend's life. However, Paul, Paul completely shuts the idea down and shows straight away why he's doing things for himself. He says that he's now leading the way and that their mothers warned them about his coming. He explains pretty bluntly that their ways are pretty stupid and that you shouldn't destroy the best of you just to keep up a tradition. He's also told that he can't speak if he's not the leader but he still completely breaks this rule too. It symbolically shows that he's tearing down the ways of the Fremen and in doing this replacing it with himself. Personally I believe that he saw Chani's death and also knew that this was one of the only ways to save her. This is why in the end he subtly hints to her about what's going on with Irulan which is something that stands out more on a second watch. Either way this obviously doesn't go down too well but Paul commands the crowd and instantly shuts them down. Picking up on someone's past, he lists off things he shouldn't know and this makes the fighter instantly bow before him. In doing this, everyone else follows suit and it's such a powerful way to show the power of belief. Now I take this scene in one of two ways, with it being something that you can potentially view due to his new abilities. The first is that he's either picked up her memories from the water of life and is able to see in as someone's genetic memory. I think the more likely one though is that he saw this conversation playing out millions of different ways and then used that as a guide to say the right things. Rather than being a psychic he's seen the outcomes that will now lead to them all bowing before him. 
Even picking out this specific soldier is something he may have not done in an alternate pathway, and it's a moment you can see from lots of different angles. Just him saying that their mothers warned them of his coming shows that he's also embracing the Benny's manipulation. Throughout the film, he's constantly talked about how it's been used to save the group, but now he's happy to use it to his advantage. However, he also mentions Arrakis's prior named June. This is what completes the scene and transforms him from a man into a messiah. Telling them to fear the moment, he controls them through their inability to stand up to him and thus he's able to seize control. Chalamet is completely knocking it out of the park and delivering what I personally think is the actor's best performance. He can completely see why Paul sways their mind and he promises that he'll lead them to a green paradise. This is something that the Fremen have wanted for so long and they now believe it's possible. It's totally something that cult leaders use and politicians of course also weaponize promises to get people to follow them. In this moment we instantly understand what it's like to be part of a cult and I'm sure you know yourself what it's like getting swept up in this moment. I have to admit I was taken away by it and this shows the depths of Paul's manipulation. We want him to win and we want him to do this even though we know it could lead to billions of deaths. The idea of revenge is too much for us now too and we're happy to go along with it even though we know the outcome. We don't even know if the prophecy is true ourselves but want to see Paul get his revenge. So we overlook things and brush them to the side because we take Paul as being that chosen one. He then pulls out his father's ring and to me this shows what the most important thing is to him. He's finally accepting the burden of being a duke but also highlighting the driving force of his actions. I don't think it's any coincidence that we then cut to Gurney who smiles almost like he thought Paul may have forgotten it. Personally though, I think this is Denny telling us the reason why he's doing this and it's in fact just about revenge. He's willing to wage war because there's no other way in which he and his loved ones survived and thus that's more important to him. Now it might be something that I'm completely misrepresenting and that's another thing that I love about this moment. You can easily take it in several different ways and I might watch it again and see something completely different. That to me is the sign of a great film and this is one of my favourite moments in a movie ever. I could have easily picked like 4 or 5 scenes from this film because there's so many that make this movie a masterpiece. This is the moment that sticks out for me the most though as it's truly a complex character scene. It shows the fall of a man that comes dressed up in what he sees as a victory. The prophet. Why is that a bad thing? Use it. Because all my visions lead to horror. <laughs> Because you lose control. Because I gain it. That to me sums it all up and Paul has lost his way but it still seems like a win. It's such a good way to put across the message in the movie and it's all exemplified in this one scene. This is a film that has gigantic sandworms and laser fights but the most powerful moment is one man in a room. It truly is the perfect scene and I hope you've enjoyed us going through the moment. Please drop a like on the video and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society then please click the join button. You get early access to videos every week, I'll lead you to paradise and it goes such a long way to helping us out. Now if you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, we've also got our t-shirt line located below the video that will let you pick up all kinds of tops like our Theory Time one, it's all connected stuff, House of Dragon, Marvel Tees and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time too so definitely keep an eye out and thanks for your support. Now if you want something else to watch, you've got a June video on screen right now going over what would have happened if Fade had won the fight. I'm seeing alternate realities in that one and yeah, lots of things to unpack from it so definitely head over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sitting through the video, I've been your host Paul and I'll see you next time. You take care, peace.